Did you know that God could say different things and still never contradict Himself? Hello, this is Tony Broom Ministries. Welcome to the following Bible study entitled, Saying Different Things Without Contradiction. God's Word is without contradiction. God does not contradict Himself. Let's get that straight right out of the gate. God's Word always says the same thing. It does not change. There is no contradiction. If you have read it 20 years ago, or will read it 20 years into the future, it will still be the same. It will still say the same thing and mean the same thing. Even though God's Word is always the same, He can say different things within that Word and yet remain without contradiction. God is the only one in the universe who can do that. No wonder Dr. Billy Graham once said, God is the only one in the universe who can really actually forget. God chooses to forget. And of course, we can too, now that we are in His kingdom. God is always truthful, no matter what. No matter what the case, no matter what the circumstance, God is always truthful. From Romans chapter 3, verse 4, Let God be true, but Tony, no, every man a liar. Let God be true, but every man, you can put your name, every man, every woman a liar. That simply means that if it has to be, that everyone in the cosmos, everyone in the universe would have to be a lie in order for God to be true, then that's the way it has to be. Let God be true, but every man a liar. God is true and truthful no matter what. Here are some examples where we can find God saying different things, yet without any contradiction. And here are two brief yet perfect examples of this, one from the Old Testament and another from the New Testament, to show that God can say different things in His Word and yet still be without contradiction. Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be likened to him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. You have two verses, one right next to the other. And the first one says, don't answer a fool. Verse 5 says, answer a fool. Well, what should I do? Should I answer the fool? Or should I not answer the fool? What determines how you are to answer a fool? The circumstance and situation at hand. Circumstances and situations do not determine God's Word, but God's Word, which is already determined and forever settled in heaven, has provision and application to meet differing circumstances and situations. If the situation calls for it, you're not to answer him. But if the situation and circumstance calls for it, you have to answer him. If you always answer a fool, you'll be in his ball game. You'll be like him. But if you never answer a fool, then he's right in his own conceit. He always thinks he's right. So sometimes you have to answer him. Sometimes you have to not answer. It is according to the circumstance and situation at hand. The Bible says, Judas went out and hung himself. Go and do thou likewise. Well, you know that doesn't apply. Even though Judas went out and hung himself, the go and do thou likewise is a totally different situation. So that's the Old Testament example. Here is the New Testament. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's Galatians 6, 2. And here's verse 5. For every man shall bear his own burden. You see God saying different things in two different verses, but yet He's never in contradiction to Himself. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's love. But every man will bear his own burden. So, what determines when we are to bear one another's burdens or 
when one is to be expected to bear their own burden. Love and laziness. Love says we need to help each other out. We need to help our fellow lift his load. But laziness says you cannot expect everybody to tote your own load always. you got to get busy and do it yourself. And so it's the circumstance, it's the situation at hand. Some people think that Jesus went about with a Peter Popoff, some of you may remember that name, a fake preacher, earphone in his ear from the father saying, all right, son, go this way, go, stop, okay, turn left, turn left, there's a lady right over there, yeah, yeah that's right, one with the brown hair, okay, now she's got a problem down at her back, okay, son, right there, touch her. That's not what God did. That's not what Jesus did. Yes, Jesus knew what people thought. He knew all these things. But Jesus, when the situations presented themselves, He took care of the problem at hand. Whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation called for, He was there to meet the problem. He was there to answer the question. That's what you and I need to get better at in kingdom business instead of being blindsided so much. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. That's love. The law of Christ is love. It's not talking about Mosaic law or things on the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. It's talking about fulfilling the law of Christ. That's love. But every man will bear his own burden, and that keeps away from laziness. So there you have your examples, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament. Now here's our application. Now we will apply what we have learned using several passages from the New Testament which have to do with women and their role in church, home, and ministry. And now you know, as Paul Harvey said, the rest of the story as to why I might be recording this in my home studio and not in church where I could be hit with eggs in the face. Well, we don't worry about that. I'll do it wherever God wants me to do it. But I'm glad I can talk to you sometimes outside of the church building. and We can talk together from God's Word. What about women, the role in the home and church and in ministry? In case the material is a little too delicate or uncomfortable for you, we will let the Apostle Paul, who wrote, most of the New Testament. Take responsibility for the Word. Ready? Okay, here we go. Let's get the sour pickles out of the way first to begin with so we can finish up with a chocolate-covered cherry dessert. Woo! 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What in the world have we here? Well, let's be comfortable to talk about God's Word. You don't think Paul was a chauvinist pig, do you? Trying to pull something over on God's people? After all, he's the one who taught us about the gifts of the Spirit. He's the one who taught us about tongues and baptism of the Holy Spirit, proper use of gifts, tongues, and prophecy in the church, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He taught us about spiritual gifts, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and of course that great love chapter in chapter 13. So certainly Paul is not against women. He used women more than anybody else, and he had a wonderful relationship with women and men in the church of Jesus Christ. What is this all about? This has to do with handling business matters and leadership in the church. God is not the author of confusion, as verse 33 says. It ensures that all things are done decently and in order, and that's verse 40. It hasn't anything to do with praise and worship or proclaiming God's Word. Anybody can praise God. Anybody can worship and bless God. It's amazing to me that all of our Pentecostal brothers 
They teach from 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They go all through it. Somehow they leave out verses 34 and 35. Why in the world do you think that might be? Perhaps there are two reasons. One is they don't want to offend anybody. And the other is they really don't believe it. They don't believe that applies anymore today. They think that Paul was just giving that in the time that he lived in. But our time that we live in, you have all these women that are speaking in church and they're involved in ministry. So that doesn't apply anymore. Well, Let's say if 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 34 and 35, if that is not the Word of God, if that doesn't apply anymore, then perhaps John 3, 16 is out of whack. Perhaps Acts chapter 2, verse 4, they were all filled in the Holy Ghost, spake with tongues. Perhaps that's out of style now. You don't need to do that anymore. What about going to church? Oh, that's out. You don't need to do that anymore. Reading the Bible. Why read the Bible? That's an old book. It's been here hundreds of years. You don't need to do that anymore. See, brothers and sisters, if you have problems with one verse, if one verse is out, all of it's out. That's what happens in what is called cessationalism. That means that people don't believe that the gifts of God, the miracles and healings and tongues and prophecy, they don't believe that any of that applies anymore. They think that when the apostles died out, when John the apostle died and all these things passed away, they don't believe that God heals anymore. Oh, they say He can, but they just don't believe He will. And the miraculous, since the Bible is complete, we have the canon of Scripture. They just don't believe that applies anymore. Well, I have problems. Perhaps you do too. Such verses that says, I don't have problems with the verses. I have problems with the people who don't believe. They think that everything is stopped. Everything has ceased. Whatever they don't like has stopped. Yeah, it has stopped according to them because you don't have to worry if you don't believe it. If you don't want it, God's not going to force it on you. What about verses like Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever? When Paul was talking about women being silent in the church, he was not talking about praising and worshiping God. He was not talking about giving a message in tongues. That's been done throughout the years, interpretation. I'll tell you what he was talking about. He was talking about these gals that jump up in church and take over the church, and take over the preacher and interrupt and cause trouble and squawk and squeal and get a deal, Lucille, and everything else you can think of. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about the issue there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 was the proper use of the gifts of God. And in dealing with that, he wanted to hold down confusion. As verse 33 says, God is not the author of confusion. He doesn't have anything to do with praise and worshiping God. What about Ephesians chapter 5, verse 22, 3 and 4? Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. The Christian home is the only way this world will know what Christ and His church are like. That's the only way they'll know. They can see what Christ and His church is like in no other way than in the Christian home. The Christian husband and wife is a type of Christ and His church, bride, His church, like no other. And if that is out of whack in the home, it will destroy a type of Christ in the church. That image will not be portrayed in the right way to this world and even in the church of our Lord itself. We'll have a marred image. We'll have a dysfunctional element. That's the way it will be presented. And God is not that way in heaven. The church is subject to Christ. And that's the way the Christian wife is to be to her Christian husband, to be submissive in the Lord. Christ is the head of the church, just like the husband is the head of the wife. It's a beautiful thing when it's done in the right way. Jesus never asks us to do something that he was not willing to do himself. In eternity past, 
when He was on earth and even now in heaven and throughout eternity future. He always was, is now, and forever will be subject to God the Father. In that way, God may be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15, 29. Jesus Himself will deliver up the kingdom to God the Father. The last enemy who will be destroyed is death. When He will have put down all rule and all authority, He Himself will be subject to the Father, that God may be all in all. The Son comes out of eternity past, and He says, in essence, yes, I'll go. He submits Himself to the will of God the Father, comes into a world of shame and woe, out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. Only His great eternal love will make my Savior go. And He comes and humbles Himself and becomes obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He who thought it not robbery to be equal with God made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant and was found in humbleness. In the likeness of sinful flesh, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And that's why God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The husband and the wife, Christ and His church. For a woman to say, I don't like that, I ain't going to do that. There's some sanctification that needs to take place because we will gladly do what Jesus did for us when He submitted Himself to that beating and shame and spitting. The God of glory the Prince of Life, the Creator, God the Son, the Creator Himself. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. All things. He created all things as well and in conjunction with the Father and the Spirit. Jesus Christ created all things. He came to His own. His own received Him not, but as many as received Him. To them gave He power to become the sons of God. He submitted Himself to the will of God the Father. And He endured all that shame, that disgrace of the cross. Now He's risen in power and glory and throughout the ages of eternity. Even though God has given all things into His hand, He will continually honor God the Father. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, all God, all equal in attributes, the three persons. God the Father, He's the first person of the Godhead, the one who initiated everything. God the Son, He's the one who came, the Word of God, to do the Father's work. God the Holy Ghost, He's the power of God in the furnace that makes everything run. It all works together. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. God cares more about the person of the heart than the position in the church. His girls will feel the same way that he does about it. Let the woman learn in silence and not usurp authority over the man. That's what Paul is saying. Not saying that she shouldn't teach God's Word. Not saying that she cannot proclaim God's Word. But God has designed that man, men, would lead the church and lead the home. That's the way it should be. Just like God the Father leads the Son. God the Son prays to the Father. The Father presents the Holy Ghost to the church as a gift. He comes into the world and fills the hearts and lives of believers. The Godhead works together. Perfect unity and harmony, always. That's the way it is to be in the Christian woman and the Christian man. 
Paul is the one who tells us about teaching. He's the one who teaches us about teaching and preaching. He's the one who tells us that the purpose of the fivefold ministry, the apostle and the prophet, evangelist and pastor and teacher, he tells us what that is. That's for the equipping of the body of Christ, the work of the ministry and the edifying of the body is to keep away false doctrine, is to keep the maturing of the body of Christ happening until we all come in the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God and to a perfection of the fullness of the measure of the stature of Christ. That's what it's all about. Don't worry about the name. Just do the work of the ministry. First Peter chapter 3, verse 1 now. We have about six verses here. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. A man who is not even saved can be won by the behavior of his wife. If she's submissive, if she's serving God, pleasing God, that will speak to a man like nothing else. While they behold your chaste, your dedicated conversation, your behavior coupled with fear, that fear is respect. Whose adorning? Let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Doesn't mean don't put any clothes on. Adam and Eve had a problem with that after they sinned. They had to cover that up. And as I said before, Eve's skimpy bikini fig leaves didn't work. So God had to provide them something better. He's not talking about not putting on any clothes. He's talking about don't let that be the big thing. Fads and fashion to this age. But let it be the hidden man, the hidden person of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. You want a beautiful ornament to put around your neck, on your arms? Let it be the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Ha, 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 I ain't going to call my husband Lord. Well, you won't be the mother of many nations like Sarah was either, will you? Sarah, she had problems just like we do. She giggled and laughed when she shouldn't have. But she received strength, Hebrews chapter 11 says, to conceive seed and bear a child when she was well past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. That's the kind of woman you want to follow. You don't want to follow these Hollywood flusies on television. You want to follow a woman who's got the goods. I say this reverently, a woman who's got the ghost. Who got about so that's the kind of person you want to follow. You want to follow somebody who is in touch with God and prays and worships the Lord. Paul must not have been so much of a square after all, since Peter says the same thing in his writings. And even though they say different things sometimes, they still do not contradict each other. When you display the Christian heart of beauty and holiness instead of of the culture craze, latest fads and fashion, the result now will be the same as it was then. Families will be touched and people will be one to God. The husband cannot get away from the change that takes place in the life of his wife who comes to Christ. I know jealousy sets in sometimes. I know that old Terry and John, they feel like they've lost their woman because you used to be their God. Now God's their God. You don't like it because she's paying attention to God. She's paying attention to the preacher. I don't mean that in a sensual way. I'm just talking about she ministers in the church. She loves the preacher. She loves the church. She loves the people of God. And you got a crawfish problem with it, don't you, Hoss? Yeah, it's getting next to you, ain't it? Yeah, pour it on, Lord. Pour it on him. God's going to get you. The Holy Ghost hounds of heaven 
are after you. I'd rather have the hounds of heaven after me than the hounds of hell after me. God's calling your number. He wants you to come to Him. Well, the heavy meal is finished, and now the delightful cherry dessert is served. Acts chapter 2, verses 17 and 18. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams, and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my Spirit, and they shall prophesy. Wait a minute, I think I hear some sons, I hear some daughters, hello women, I hear some servants, I hear some handmaidens. They're prophesying. They're receiving the Holy Ghost. God is pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. And it doesn't matter to sons and daughters, servants and handmaids, men and women, boys and girls. God is pouring out His Spirit. Pentecost makes the difference. Salvation makes the difference. Sanctification makes the difference. That is what it's all about. It's not a name. It's not a position in the church. All that has its place. But the important thing, the Holy Ghost brings it together. Never mind the games and the names. Everyone is invited to be saved. Everyone is invited to be sanctified. Everyone is invited to be baptized in the Holy Ghost. If God can talk from Mount Sinai and speak through Balaam's donkey, don't you think he has no problem speaking through a man or a woman who will make themselves available to God? Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For ye are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. All of you are. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. All of you are baptized in the Lord. You've been identified with Christ. You're children of God. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. God puts it all together in one body. Male, female, Jew, Gentile, red, yellow, black and white. This passage does not do away with gender. It is quite unfortunate that ministers have portrayed it to be like that. Rather, it enhances gender, while at the same time not letting it get in the way. Jezebel justified herself and was judged. Mary humbled herself by saying, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, be it unto me according to thy word. Luke chapter 1, verse 38. And the world has a Savior because of it. I'd rather have Mary's magnificence than Jezebel's judgment any time, wouldn't you? God can say different things without ever contradicting Himself. I want to thank you for listening to this Bible study. The title has been Saying Different Things Without Contradiction. Make sure that Jesus Christ is your Savior. If you're a man, if you're a woman, that really doesn't matter. What matters is whether you're saved or whether you're lost, whether your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, whether you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, whether you have made Him your Lord. Saying different things without contradiction has been a production of Tony Broom Ministries.